practice what you preach. Hallelujah. Practice, practice what you preach. I'm here to tell you that it's what you do, not what you say. It's going to count on Judgment Day. So practice, practice what you preach. Now, Deacon Joe, who's sitting here, he runs a butcher shop. He loves to quote the Bible as he weighs a steak or chop. Well, Deacon, that sounds mighty fine, but tell me just how come he charges you for a pound of meat and a half a pound of thumb. Practice. Practice what you preach. Hallelujah. Practice. Practice what you preach. I'm here to tell you that it's what you do, not what you say. That's going to count on Judgment Day. So practice. Practice what you preach. Now, brother, boy, and we hear your voice singing in the choir. You've memorized the hymn book, and that's a fact we all admire. But if St. Peter hears your song, I kind of calculate. He also hears them buttons you keep dropping in the play. But we got a sister here who gossips quite a lot. She knows who's going where with who and if they ain't fine. Well, sister, if you'd like to stand beside that golden throne, stop talking about your neighbor's sins, start thinking about your own. Well, brother, practice. Welcome to our presentation here for Sunday the 22nd, the last Sunday before Thanksgiving. Today our lesson is going to be from the book of Psalms, the 99th Psalm, chapters 1, or excuse me, verses 1 through 9. Now, what do we know about God? In Genesis Chapter 1, verse 1 said, God created the heavens and the earth. And in Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 25 and 26 says, He knows the stars by name. All of them. Literally, literally thousands of them. In Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17 this says, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers of rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. David affirmed that, when he asked God to help him out, he was in a pretty difficult place because he had fled from his son Absalom. And in Psalm 3, verse 4, he gave thanks and a confirmation to God for hearing his prayer and answering it. Now, our lesson today starts here on the first verse of chapter 99 and ask us to commit ourselves to worship. The Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He is enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Bible affirms how at times the Lord's glory would appear in a cloud of smoke between the cherubim. And so as they were traveling along the way, as they escaped from, from Egypt, God was in this cloud of smoke. And in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4 says, 
So the people sent men to Shiloh and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. Verse 2 says, The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted above all the peoples. Now, what is Zion? Some of you may know, excuse me, there are churches. There are a lot of Zion Baptist churches. What is Zion anyway? Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, David, he was king, he captured the fortress of the Zion, the city of David. Where was Zion? It says it was the city of David. It was Jerusalem. And so there will be a day when we will enter the new Jerusalem or the new Zion. It can be called that also. As we continue looking at this in verse 3, it says, let them praise your great and awesome, inspiring name. What does it mean, this inspiring name? Well, we find that he is holy. The people fear the Lord even though they knew he was on their side. This is what Mark wrote in the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 39. In Isaiah, again, chapter 6, verse 3 says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. God controls sizable armies. Had Christ wanted to on the day that he was crucified, he could have had 10,000 or 10 times 10,000 angels, an army of angels from God and could have annihilated everything and everybody, but he chose not to, so that he could fulfill our scripture and do as his father had asked him to. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. Verse four says this, the mighty king loves justice. You have established fairness you administer justice and righteousness in, ja in Jacob. Now, who is Jacob? Well, that's Israel. Jacob was the second son of the twins born to Isaac and Rebekah. He was Rebekah's favorite. And so God had pretty well indicated that Jacob was going to be the one that would rule over his brother. But Rebecca, you may recall, she decided to help things out. So she put, uh, she was patting on his arm so he'd be rough like his brother Esau. And he deceived his father and got his blessing. And we can only wonder what God would have done had she not done that. But no doubt he had something else in mind before Rebecca interceded. Verse 5 says, Exalt the Lord our God. Bow in worship at his footstool. In Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1 says this. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. He is holy. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow in worship at his footstool. My, one of the things I think I can look forward to when I go to heaven, and maybe some of you can too, is that I will be able to bow <laughs> without leaning over a little too much. And I'll be able to get down on my knees again. Talk to a friend today, Patty. She, she was telling me that uh, she'd been having some problems with her knee and I guess she needed some help. Many people I know have had problems with their knees. Friends, when we get to heaven, there's not gonna be any problems. We can bow down at the footstool of our master, of our God, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it says in Joshua, the first chapter, verse seven says this, as people followed God, they should turn neither to the right 
nor to the left. Fairness in Hebrew means to be straight. Heaven knows we live in a time now where we have right-leaning individuals and left-leaning individuals and most of us are following one of the other categories. But if we go by the ancient Hebrew, we should go straight. We should be straight with God and proceed with the things that he wants us to do. What does he want us to do? Well, we need to read the Bible. It tells us things we can do. We need to talk to God in prayer. It tells us what we can do. Now, last week, we talked some about prayer, and we found that <laughs> prayer can be a lot of wonderful things. But a lot of times, when people pray, it's because they're in great need for something. And we need it right now, Lord. Well, please help me with this, that, or the other, whatever the case may be. I once witnessed to a young man, I was in my twenties at the time, he came to my Sunday school class and he wasn't a Christian. And I, as I talked with him, I said, why don't you want to be a Christian? And he said, I was just back from Vietnam. And he said, I found it interesting, the number of guys that I was with who never ever talked about their God until they got hit with some shrapnel or a bullet. And then they cried out to him. And he said, I think it's the most unfair thing I can think of to call on a God you never recognize only when you get in trouble. Now, he made a good point. Of course, the beautiful part of God is he is loving and forgiving, and he will forgive us anything. All we have to do is ask him. As far as I know, this fellow never made a, a commitment to Jesus. I wish now that he had. And hopefully maybe he did. Because I have no idea where he is at this point or where his children are or any of those things. As we continue here with verse 6, this says Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Whose priests? The priests that God ordained for Israel. Now today... We are our own priest. That's what Southern Baptists believe. And we find this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. We have a concept as Southern Baptists called the priesthood of the believers. What we believe is that we can talk to God directly. We do not need to have anyone intercede for us in prayer. We can do this because we are our own priest. Now, friends, I don't know about you, but I don't always have priestly garments on. I don't always have priestly thoughts in my mind or in my heart, but I can talk to God anytime, and I know he listens to me. Sometimes he doesn't grant the things I ask for, at least not when I would like them, but he does things in his own time. And so each of us have to get, can get in tune with the things that God wants and what he wants them. Samuel was one who called on God's name frequently. You remember Samuel? Samuel's mother was a lady named Hannah. And in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, tell a little bit about her. Hannah prayed to the Lord for a son. And once the Lord granted her prayer, she, after he was weaned, probably at three years old, she rededicated him to the Lord. She took him to Eli, where he stayed. Now Samuel was, uh, he became certainly a great overseer for Israel. And you may recall he anointed the first two kings of Israel, both Saul and David. They were done by his anointment. Samuel was a man of God. 
and he was trained. Eli had two sons. They were wicked, that's what the Bible says. And so eventually they were killed. And when the army of Israel was also routed, well, old Eli, who was not able to get around very well, sitting on his porch in a chair, and he fell off and broke his neck, and they killed him. Samuel, nonetheless, like David, was a man after God's own heart. In verse 7, it says, He, meaning God, spoke to them in a pillar of a cloud. We mentioned that. They keep his decrees and the statutes that he gave them. Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their sinful actions. God punishes sin, but he will forgive us of our sins. He did David. David did things that were not only against tradition, they were illegal, they were immoral, and yet when he asked God to forgive him, he did. But part of David's direction was that he was not allowed to build a temple. He'd spill too much blood. And I often wondered about when he had his general move Uriah to the forefront of the battle and then withdraw from him so he'd be killed. I, I just I can't help but wonder what was in his mind at that time. But nonetheless, when confronted with that, David went to God and asked for forgiveness, and he was given that. Verse 9 says, Exalt the Lord our God, bow and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. In Psalm 132, verse 7 says, Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. In James, Jesus' brother, his book, chapter 4, verse 2 says, He stated that often we didn't have what we needed because we failed to ask God for. And I'll be honest with you, there was a time earlier in my life when I tried not to bother God about little things. Friends, I'm bothering about anything that's bothering me right now. Uh, and <clears throat> the older you get, the more things there are that you can be bothered about. Where on earth did I put my car keys, you know? Am I going to open up the refrigerator door and find them in there? Well, <laughs> I did find a pair of glasses there one time, so I, don't ask me how that happened. I have no idea. But the older you get, sometimes your mind plays tricks on you, and sometimes it just doesn't work very well. And so I found that even with the smallest things, God wants to hear from me. But I don't think it's enough to always have to ask him for something. We do. We do repeatedly. But I think we should give some thanks more often than not. We're approaching a week. We're on this coming Thursday. Many of us in America will experience a different day because we have been under this pandemic for, what, practically nine months. And it's changed our lives somewhat we're not sure what the next step is. Do we get all of our family together? Uh, some folks are discouraging that. That's a question, Mary, that I've talked about. We're not sure exactly what we're gonna do on Thanksgiving Day. Our, our initial plans were to go visit with our youngest granddaughter down below Lincoln. Unfortunately, she is recovering from the COVID virus. She and a number of her fellow nurses were exposed by a patient who gave them the virus. And so we have prayed for her. We do believe God has answered our prayers as he has for the prayers of others that are with her and that she's going to be able to recover. As a matter of fact, uh, she went into work a little early this week. It seems all the nurses in our hospital were out, including Carson's boss, who called her from home and said, we got a problem. We've got some nurses coming in from another area. 
and they don't know anything about our hospital. So she asked Carson to come in and work for four hours to at least explain some of the things they did, how they did them, and where things were. And so she did. Now, I suspect this coming weekend, she will be able to return to work. And I know that she will have a pleasant and wonderful day on Thanksgiving. And as, as I have said, Mary, and I haven't really decided what we're going to do. And some of you may be in the same situation. But you know, we can be thankful for a lot of things that we have. I suspect that most of you are like me. You've had plenty of food to eat. I, I don't, uh, I don't know that this was a, a bad time to have uh, certain things. I guess it was a bad time to go on a diet because uh, <clears throat> when, you have, when you're around food and it's privilege, you're going to eat it. And I am so thankful that so many people I know, some of you included, have had folks to bring them things for their table, either from their crops or from going shopping for them. And I think that's so wonderful. And it just gives me a, a real warm feeling to know that we still have the love of others in our heart. And I think we can praise the Lord for all the good things he's done for us. And I hope our prayers will include many of the things that we have. We friends will someday be relieved of all our burdens. We will be able to get out on our knees. And you know what? We're going to look pretty good. I tell you that. I can smile about it. You know, I, <laughs> I kind of think I might get some hair back when I get in heaven. I, I don't know what your deficiencies are. I got a bunch of them. But you know, the beauty of it is the Bible tells us that we're going to be like him, meaning Christ. And so when you picture Christ at 33 when he died, perhaps you might want to take a good look at some picture of you when you were about 33 because there are some, and me included, believe that's probably how we'll look at that time. It's been so good to be with you today, and I'm grateful for all of you that have tuned in. This may be a little bit shorter than usual. The music you heard is just a, a song that the fellows and I decided we'd do uh, this week called Practice What You Preach. Uh, it's kind of a funny song, but I hope you enjoy it. And to end our service today, I'd like to end it with a, a song for prayer. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me. Thank you, Lord, for all that I see. Thank you, Lord, for thy bondress care. Thank you for all of the world you share. Lord, we do thank you and we do praise you for all the good and wonderful things that you do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. I pray that you'll have a blessed week, a wonderful Thanksgiving, and that you will continue to be careful in all the things that you say and do. Thank you again.